to class. Uh, thank you all for joining uh, class this morning. Uh, we are going to begin uh, studying chapter 11. Can you hear me? We're going to begin studying chapter 11 today. So uh, the online students, you all missed class, right, on uh, Friday. So please uh, listen to the lecture recordings. Uh, we'll continue with uh, chapter 11, the Christ's resurrection and his ascension. Sorry, Christ's resurrection and his exaltation. Okay. Uh, we'll begin with a word of prayer. Would anyone like to lead us in prayer, please? Anyone, the online students, in-person students, anyone like to lead us in prayer? Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for enabling us to gather here and to read and to understand your word. We pray for your wisdom and for your blessings as we continue to learn more from your scriptures and your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So we look at um, Christ's resurrection, okay, uh, where it is already foretold or mentioned that the Messiah would come and that he would resurrect from the dead. Uh, let's look at Psalms chapter 16, verses 9 to 11. So can one of you please read Psalms chapter 16, verses 9 to 11, please? Psalm 16, 9 to 11. Therefore, my heart is glad, and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Amen. So who's writing this psalm? It's the psalm of David, yes. So he says, "My therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices, okay, and my flesh will rest in hope. So um, actually there has been um, many scholars who debate or there has been uh, a debate among the scholars that, uh, you know, that this text here, from uh, Psalms chapter 16, which was written by King David, they believe that the Holy One here in Psalm 16 is basically referring to David himself, okay? Uh, because he is the anointed king of Israel. But do you think it's referring to David? Or David is referring to himself even though he wrote the Psalm? What do you all think? Yes, no, no. Why? <laughs> okay, it's talking about the capital H, holy. Okay, the holy one, a capital O as well, holy one. Okay, yes. Uh, how do we know? We can't just prove the capital H and a capital O. How do we know it? Oh. But Jesus wouldn't see corruption. He's referring to God's son who would not uh, see corruption. Okay, so, uh, the, the, the mention here that they will not see corruption, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption, is basically referring to Jesus. But how do we prove this from Scripture? Were there some uh, prophecies in the past? Like your, none of your bones will decay? decay. So okay. Something in line with the prophecies. Is some of the prophecies? Okay, we look at Acts chapter 2, verses 25 to 32, okay? Acts chapter 2, verses 25 to 32. So can one of you please read Acts chapter 2, verses 25 to 32, please? Acts chapter 22. No, Acts chapter 2, verse 25 to 32. Acts chapter 2, verses... Acts chapter 2, verse 25. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Verse 26. Therefore my heart rejoiced, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. Verse 27. For you will not leave my soul in hates, nor will you allow 
your holy one to see corruption verse 28 you have made known to me the ways of life you will make me full of joy in your presence verse 29 men and brethren let me speak freely to you of the patrick david that he is both dead and buried and his tomb is with us to this day verse 30 therefore being a prophet and knowing that god has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body according to the flesh he would raise up the christ to sit on his throne verse 31 he he foresee this spoke concerning the resurrection of the christ that his soul was not left in hades nor did his flesh see corruption verse 32 this jesus god has raised up of which we all are witness so here uh, who is speaking these uh, words acts chapter 2 verses 25 to 32 who is speaking these words the apostle peter yes in what instant is he speaking this when is he speaking this acts chapter 2 when is he speaking this apostle peter on the day of pentecost yes on the day of pentecost after the 120 were baptized in the holy spirit and um, there was a loud sound like a rushing wind a hurricane and many people came to the upper room where the apostles were and they all heard these men who were galileans speaking in different languages and they were all praising god okay and they all said these men are drunk so what does peter do what does peter do what does peter do he goes and talks to the crowd sorry he goes and addresses the crowd oh we can't hear the online students sorry i couldn't hear you warren Uh, can you just type it in the chat, please? Or now you can speak, Warren. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, a little more louder, please. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now is it all right now? Yes, it's fine. Yes. Yeah. So when 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 Peter sees when they start talking about the the, the apostles, Peter goes and actually addresses the crowd. Yes, Peter addresses the crowd. He basically uh, is preaching to the crowd and under the inspiration of the holy spirit the apostle peter points out to what actually david is said in psalms chapter 16 verses 9 to 11 okay so the apostle peter he points to the old testament reference and he's in what is why is he quoting what david said in psalms chapter 16 verses 9 to 11 what is he trying to prove here about christ yes about his resurrection so he's uh, he is proving to them about christ's resurrection and so he's saying for david says concerning him okay so here in verses 16 um, uh, chapter 16 verses 9 to 11 it's not basically david talking about himself and referring to himself as the holy one as some of the scholars are debating on the interpretation of this but it's basically he uh, uh, under the inspiration of the holy spirit apostle peter is saying hey this this is what david said concerning him concerning whom concerning jesus the messiah okay and so he's saying that what is he trying to prove here he's saying so the emphasis here is that christ's body rose up from the grave unlike david's which remained in the grave and so that's why he's saying here in verses um uh in verse um, 29 he says the patriarch david is both dead and buried and his tomb is with us to this day so we still have the tomb of the patriarch david but we don't have the tomb of jesus is an empty tomb so unlike christ body that rose up from the grave you know david's body is still there in the grave it's no i mean his body is in the grave it has a tombstone so is the reasoning is here that my body will also live in hope verse 26 
because you will not abandon me to the grave. It's basically talking about, you know, Peter is using David's psalm to show that Christ's body will not decay, okay, or Christ's body did not decay, and he is therefore unlike David, who was dead and was buried, okay, but Christ rose up from the dead, but David's tomb is here till to this day, verse 29, okay. So the, in, the, the debate among the scholars that, you know, Psalm 16 was written by King David, and they believe that this holy one is basically referring to David as the anointed king of Israel is not right, because we see that in the New Testament, you know, the um, apostle Peter, okay, he interprets this verse as a prophecy about Jesus Christ. He's saying, hey, this was a prophecy given about Jesus Christ. And he's talking about the fulfillment of this prophecy. Okay, So in Acts chapter 2, verses 25 to 31, the apostle Peter is basically quoting the psalm, which applies to Jesus. And he's arguing that David was not referring to himself, okay, but rather he was talking about the Messiah who was to come. Okay. So therefore, the original text of uh, Psalm 16 may have been about David in a certain sense, but the New Testament interpretation of this verse uh, looks at it as a prophetic reference to Jesus Christ, okay, the, as the ultimate one who will not see any corruption, okay. So that is what um, uh, we, we see as... Um, you know, the resurrection foretold is foretold in Psalm 16. And uh, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Peter says, hey, it is fulfilled. Okay, Christ, uh, his body is not decayed. His tomb is empty. He has resurrected from the dead. Okay, so it says this Jesus was 32. It says this Jesus was raised up of which we are all witnesses. Okay, so the apostles were all witnesses that there was an empty tomb and there was no body there. Okay, so this is talking about Christ's resurrection foretold and the prophecy that was fulfilled in Christ's resurrection. Any questions? Any doubts you all have? No? Okay. Yes, Miriam? Oh, sorry, Mary, we can't hear you. Uh, Miriam, can you please mute your mic if you're not asking a question, please? Uh, Miriam, are you asking a question or you just accidentally? Unmuted your mic. Okay. So I've just manually muted your mic, Miriam. So in case you want to ask a question, please uh, let me know on the chat section and I will unmute you. Okay, so we'll move on. Uh, we look at how Jesus himself foretold of his resurrection in different ways. Okay, even before he died on the cross, Jesus spoke about his resurrection. So we're going to read a couple of verses here. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. Matthew chapter 17, verses 22 and 23. Matthew chapter 26, verses 30 to 32. Uh, John chapter 2, verses 18 to 22. And Luke chapter 24, verses 1 to 8. So we just basically read these scripture passages that, um, uh, for, that Jesus himself foretells of his resurrection. Okay. So can different people read these passages, please? We'll have uh, the first one read to us from Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. Matthew. I will read, sister. Yes, please go ahead to get through it. Yeah. Uh, from that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Amen. 
So here we see that Jesus is saying or telling his disciples that he is going to Jerusalem, he will suffer many things, okay, and he will be killed and he will raise up on the third day, okay. Can someone else please read Matthew chapter 17 verses 22 to 23, please? Shall I go ahead? Yeah, go ahead, Lucy, and then we can have Warren read uh, Matthew 26, 30 to 32. Chapter 17, sister, verses from? 22 to 23. Now while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and third day he will be raised up, and they were exceedingly sorrowful. Amen. So here we again see he's talking about his uh, betrayal, his death, and that he will uh, rise, raise up, he will rise up on the third day. Uh, Matthew 26, 30 to 32, Warren. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Amen. So Jesus is telling them what will happen to the disciples when he is arrested, when he is persecuted, uh, when he is put to death. And what will happen after he is raised uh, back to life? He says he will go before them and meet them at in Galilee. Uh, John chapter 2, verses 18 to 22. John chapter 2, verse 18. So the Jews answered and said to him, What sign do you show to us since you do these things? Verse 19. Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Verse 20. Then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? Verse 21. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Verse 22. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Amen. Thank you. So here we see that Jesus clears the temple. And after he clears his temple, he tells them to stop turning his father's house into a marketplace. And uh, Jesus says that he will destroy this temple and he will build it up in, raise it up in three days. But he was speaking basically about which body or which temple was he talking about? Sorry. He's referring to his body as the temple. Okay. And when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered what he had said to them. And they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken to uh, them. So they see that, you know, resurrection was not something like a magic or something God did or hid Jesus' body in some place or took him away, you know. But they remembered what Jesus had spoken to them, that he would be, he would raise up from the dead on the third day. Okay, and then when he appeared in Galilee again, they remembered his words. Let's uh, read uh, the last reference, um, Luke 24, verses 1 to 8, where Jesus is uh, telling about his own, uh, foretells about his own resurrection. Luke 24, verses 1 to 8, please. Luke 24, verses 1 to 8. Now, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments, then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words, yeah, that's it. Yes, sister. Yeah, thank you, Sister Gertrude. 
So here uh, we see that uh, after the, on the third day, you know, very early, uh, the first day of the week, very early in the morning, when this woman went to the tomb, it was um, the third day since Jesus had died. Uh, you see his body is not there. They, they're, they're very anxious. They're very worried. They're perplexed. And, um, you know, they were afraid and they're asking, you know, where is Jesus? So, um, you know, and the um, angel there says, why are you looking for? The living among the, the dead. dead. Yes, he's not here. Remember what he told you uh, when he was still with you in Galilee, that he would be crucified and on the third day he would rise up again. And they remembered his words okay so we see that all of the uh, references that we read where jesus says he will suffer and he will be killed but he will raise up on the third day uh, we see that happening we read that happening and we have witnesses and people to testify and one of the places is luke chapter 24 verses 1 to 8 okay any questions any questions so far Okay, so we look at um, how Jesus showed himself alive after his resurrection. Okay, um, uh, we read in Acts chapter 1 verse 3 that, you know, uh, Jesus presented himself alive after his suffering um, by many infallible proofs, um, you know, uh, which people saw, which people witnessed, you know, which is infallible means very reliable proofs. Uh, you know, uh, that he was alive and uh, he shows himself in that 40 day period. And also he speaks to them about the things uh, uh, regarding the kingdom of God. So after he rose up from the dead, you know, he meets them again in Galilee. And this 40 day period, he, you know, he gives them many proofs that he has risen, that he is the same Jesus. And also, um, you know, he speaks to them about various things regarding the kingdom of um, God. So we see that Jesus shows himself alive. We read about this in Acts chapter 1, verses 3, and also 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 to 8. Can uh, Angeline Mercy, would you like to read that, please? 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 to 8. Sure. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 to 8. Uh, moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which you, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which is that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Uh, was it one, two, three? Hmm? Sorry, it is three to eight. So you can continue reading till verse eight, please. Okay, sure. Uh, and that he was buried and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. And after he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. Amen. Thank you, Angeline. So here, what is Paul testifying to? What is Paul testifying to? What is Paul testifying? Jesus well, uh, Jesus was uh, Jesus died and buried and he resurrected. Yes, so, uh, testifying of his resurrection. Yes, thank you, Lucy. It's testifying here of Christ's resurrection. He's talking that he's proving that Christ died for our sins, uh, as it was mentioned in Scripture that he was buried, that he rose again on the third day, again according to Scriptures. Okay, and then he was seen by. Cephas, he was seen by the 12 apostles. He was seen also by 500 brethren, believers all at once. Also, he was seen by James and all the other apostles. And uh, uh, Paul is saying, last of all, he was seen by me. So 
Paul is basically saying, I also saw this resurrected Christ. When did he see this resurrected Christ? When Jesus encountered him. On the road uh, to yes. Damascus. Okay, on the road to Damascus. It says, last of all, he's seen by me. Um, and uh, he's saying, even by some of them who are still alive today, when Paul was writing, basically, he's saying it was, you know, um, there are many who are still alive who've seen the resurrected Jesus Christ, but many of them have already uh, died. So he's actually talking about the proof of Christ's resurrection. Why is he talking about the proof of Christ's resurrection? He's bearing the witness that he has seen. Okay, he's bearing witness, but why should he mention it? Why should he mention it? So he's basically talking to the Jews. Okay, Paul was a very zealous Jew. He had a burden for his Jewish people, the Jewish race, that they should know uh, Jesus not just as you know, uh, uh, you know, a cursed man who was you know hung on the tree, but as the Messiah who was foretold, who came, who died, who resurrected. So he's giving them evidence that this Jesus is actually the Messiah who was spoken of and that he's risen and he rose again and we have evidence to the fact that he has risen okay so we um, see through scripture there are these are the proofs that talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ okay so we'll also look at Christ's exaltation okay just a uh, a few scripture passages that we will read on um, uh, Christ's exaltation, where Christ is seated on the highest uh, throne. Uh, we'll read Mark chapter 16, verses 19 to 20. Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 to 11. First Peter 3, 22. So can some people uh, read these, please? Anyone? People who have not read can read. Mark chapter 16, verses, ma'am? Uh, 19 to 20. 19 to 20. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. Amen. Thank you. So here we see that um, after Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up to heaven. He sat down at the right hand of God. And uh, what did the disciples do? The apostles do? The believers do who witnessed this? They started preaching um, and they confirmed the word through also through signs, miracles and wonders. Okay, let's read Philippians chapter 2 verses 9 to 11, please. Therefore God also have highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that the, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord, the glory of God the Father, light bearers. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Amen. So here we see that after Jesus finished his work, what did God the Father do? What did God the Father do? Exalt him. Exalted him. Yes, exalted him, gave him the name that is above every name. So Jesus was received back uh, his glory, the glory of uh, God. And um, as God, he is worshipped, enthroned, you know, he is uh, given all the uh, praise, worship, glory, and honor. And it says here in verse 10 that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow by those in heaven and on the earth. Okay. First Peter chapter 3, verse 22. Can somebody read that, please? First Peter chapter 3, verse 22. First Peter chapter. First Peter chapter 3, verse 22. Who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers, having been made subject to him. 
Amen. Thank you, Sanjay. So here we see that, you know, uh, where's Jesus gone? To heaven, back to the Father. Uh, and he is at the right hand of God. And he has been given all the authority, power, glory, and honor. So now, after his resurrection, Jesus is where he was before his incarnation. Okay? And he is glorified with the glory that he had with the Father from eternity past, as we read in John chapter 17, verse 5. Remember, uh, when he was with the Father before, his in, before he became man, he had the glory or the deity of God. Okay, But when he came down and he became man at the incarnation, he took on the sonship glory. Okay, So we see that after his resurrection, he was exalted back to his original position. Okay, He was glorified with the glory that he had with the Father from eternity past. Uh, like as we read in John chapter 17 verse 5, he was, he is, and he will always be that eternal word. That means he will always be the eternal God, everlasting, never ending, um, the Alpha and the Omega. Okay, So resurrection, after resurrection, Christ was exalted back to his original uh, position. And we see that uh, the early church, you know, boldly preached that Christ was risen and that he was exalted and uh, we as uh, part of the new covenant part of the church the body of christ we need to also preach this truth also teach this truth about his resurrection and his exaltation okay um, now your notes it says that you will learn about the proof of his resurrection in the course on christian apologetics but I would just like to mention a few things. I would just like to, it's not here in your notes, but I just thought I'll add a little more, um, um, uh, uh, you know, meat or information uh, to this whole topic of Christ's resurrection and his exaltation. We look at the nature of Christ's resurrection. What do you think is the nature of Christ's resurrection? And then we'll also look at the doctrinal significance of resurrection now these two things are not there in your notes so if you want to take down notes you can take down so what is the nature of christ's resurrection what do you think is the nature of christ's resurrection anyone was christ's resurrection simply a coming back from the dead like Lazarus, like Jairus' daughter, like the widow's son, which was who, who Jesus raised back from death to life. Or uh, like uh, Peter who raised up uh, Tabitha. Do you think Christ's resurrection was just simply a coming back from the dead? Yes, how was it? The supernatural or miraculous, okay, Sanjay says that, and also I'm one of our um, in-person students. Lucy says, intercession for us to have righteous standing in front of God. Yes, Warren, you were saying something? Yeah, basically by, uh, by resurrection, Christ's resurrection also goes, it also conquered death and conquered sin. He conquered death, he conquered sin, okay. Yes, Mr. Uh, the those who were resurrected from the dead, they died again. But Jesus uh, resurrected and he's living forever. He lives forever more. Yes. Amen. Thank you, Sister Gertrude. Yes, we see that, you know, Christ's resurrection was not just simply, you know, coming back from the dead, like some of them had experienced before, like Lazarus and Jairus' daughter and the others who were raised upon the dead miraculously um, but you know Jesus uh, if he was just raised back from dead you know just for a time being then he would have been subject to the weakness of the flesh to aging and like Lazarus and others eventually you know he would have died just like all of us human beings rather when Jesus rose up from the dead um, yes, princess, he resurrected with a glorious body, yes. 
Uh, Deepu says, immortal, glorious, living, everlasting. Yes, thank you. So it says, uh, you know, rather when, when Christ rose up from the dead, you know, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20, he's the first fruits of those who have risen up from the dead. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 and 23 it says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Okay, so there was no one like him before from the race of Adam who was raised up from the dead and never died again. Are you all able to understand? Yes, okay. So he is, that's why he's called as the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And then uh, in verse 21, Paul is saying, For death came through one man, but the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. Okay. So uh, when Jesus rose up from the dead, he was the first fruits of a life in which okay, his body was made perfect was no longer subject to weakness, aging, death, and he was able to live eternally. Amen? Okay, so that's why it means, or that is what it means when we say Jesus was the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He was the first one from the human race, Adamic race, um, to raise up from the dead, never to, you know, go through the whole process of weakness of the flesh, aging, and dying again. But when he rose up from the dead, he lived eternally. Okay. Um, like 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 53, Paul says, he put on immortality. Okay. And Paul says, the resurrecting, resurrection body is raised uh, imperishable, in glory, in power, and a spiritual body. So look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 42 to 44. Can somebody read that, please? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 42 to 44. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 42 onwards. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is show, sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown in natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Amen. Thank you. So here we see that, you know, because of Christ's resurrection, when Christ was resurrected, you know, he was raised up imperishable, in glory, in power. And, uh, you know, he was, uh, he became who he was before the incarnation. So Christ's resurrection gives us this hope. What is the hope it gives us? What is the hope it gives us? That well, we also will be resurrected. Yes. And we will also be resurrected. And how will we be resurrected? In our same sick bodies, fragile bodies, weak bodies, sinful In bodies. New bodies. <laughs> so many people speaking. Yes, go ahead. No, we will, we will have new bodies. Sorry? We, we will have new bodies, uh, not sinful bodies. We will have um, not sinful bodies, yes. Imperishable body, glorious body, spiritual body. Amen. We will have imperishable bodies. We will be raised in glory, in power, and we'll have a spiritual body. Okay, so no longer with our weaknesses, with our frailties, with our sicknesses, uh, with all of the ailments that we go through and pain, we will not have it. And who is the hope uh, of our resurrection and we, that we will have this kind of body? Jesus, because he is the first fruits of those who have uh, fallen asleep, asleep and who is resurrected from the dead. Okay, so Bla John Bless says we will raise with glory, yes. And it's talking about Jesus. Jesus Christ was the one who has done it the first time. And because of that, we have this hope. Any questions? Any questions? No? 
Okay, so resurrection gives us this hope, gives us this assurance that we will all be raised imperishable in glory, in power, and in a spiritual body. Okay, we will now move on to the doctrinal significance of the resurrection. And we will look at a few things about the doctrinal significance of the resurrection. The first thing is uh, that Christ's resurrection and ensures our regeneration. Okay, Christ's resurrection ensures or ensures our regeneration. So, what is the meaning of regeneration? What is regeneration? What is regeneration? Yes, Prince, there. Christ's resurrection ensures our new life, yes. Uh, ensures our restoration, our renewal, our rebirth, okay. So the resurrection of Christ actually ensures our renewal, our restoration, our uh, rebirth, our new birth, um, okay, and a revival in us. Now look at what First Peter chapter one verse three says. Can somebody read First Peter chapter one verse three, please? First Peter chapter one verse three: Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Amen. Thank you, Deepu. So here. Peter is saying that we have been born anew to a living hope through the, and we have been born again. Okay, look at that. We have been born again or born a new regeneration, a new to a living hope. And how have we this new hope or how have we been born anew? It is through the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Very important scripture passage. Okay, so in his resurrection, actually Jesus earned for us a new life, just like his. Okay, so we do not receive, yes, we do not receive all of this new life, or we do not receive all of this resurrection life when we become Christians, or when we become believers, or when we are born again, because our bodies remain as they are. Our bodies are still subject to weakness, to aging, and to death. But in our spirit man, we are made alive. We are made new with this resurrection power. Okay. So thus, it is through his resurrection, okay, that Christ earned for us a new kind of life we receive when we are born again. And this is why Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 5, and six and Colossians chapter three was one. He says, you know, Christ has made us alive together. Uh, sorry, says that God has made us alive together with him in Christ Jesus. It's by grace you have been saved and raised up with him. Okay. So here it's saying that, you know, Paul is saying that God has made us alive together with Christ, it's by grace that you have been saved and raised us up with him. So last class, we looked at our spiritual identification of what Paul talks about in Romans chapter 6. So all of you um, in-person students missed it. Very important lecture. Please go and listen to that lecture on Friday, where Paul is talking about our spiritual identification, where we identify spiritually with Christ's death, his burial, his uh, resurrection, his uh, ascension, exaltation, uh, and him being seated at the right hand of God the Father. So Paul is saying God made us alive together with Christ and raised us up with him. So it is when Christ was resurrected that we also earn this new kind of life that we receive when we are born again. And also Paul you know, connects a resurrection of Christ with spiritual power that is at work within us when he tells the church at Ephesus that he's praying that in, in, in Ephesians chapter 1 verses 19 to 20, you know, Paul is basically connecting the resurrection of Christ with the spiritual power 
that is at work within us when he's writing to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 1 verses 19 and 20. He's telling them that he's praying that they would know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power in us who believe. Can somebody read Ephesians chapter 1 verses 19 to 20 please? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might? Verse 20, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Amen. Thank you, Deepu. So Paul is connecting the resurrection of Christ with the spiritual power that is at work within us and so here in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 19 and 20 you know Paul is saying that the power by which God raised Jesus Christ from the dead is the same power that is at work within us okay the dunamis power so uh, you need to be aware of the kind of power that you have received once you are a believer, once you're born again in Christ Jesus. You know, you have the same power that God used to raise Jesus back from the dead. And Paul further sees us, you know, as raised in Christ when he says in Romans chapter 6, verse 4 and verse 11. So can somebody read Romans chapter 6, verses 4 and verse 11, please? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into uh, death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Amen. So here Paul in Romans chapter 6 verse 4 and verse 11, he's saying we were buried with Christ, with him the baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Okay. So this new resurrection power in us you know, includes the power to gain more and more victory over the remaining sin in our lives look at what he says in verse uh, chapter 6 verse 14 he says sin will have no more dominion over you okay and in Coloss first corinthians chapter 15 verse 17 he says even though we will never be perfect in this life even though we will never be perfect in this life paul says that the resurrection power that is in us the same power that used uh, that God used to raise Jesus back from death to life, the same power that is in us, that same power, you know, um, um, uh, is able to get us to accomplish great things for Christ. And also this power is available to us to gain more and more victory over sin. Amen? Yes? So Paul is saying, yes, in your flesh you are not born again. You're born again only in your spirit man. And your flesh has a tendency to give in to uh, sin. I understand that. And he says, you know, oh, wretched man that I am. I don't want to do certain things, but I end up doing it. Okay. And he says, why is that? Because of the law of sin or the dominion of sin or the power of sin that controls me. And he's saying that the new resurrection power that is there in us and also he goes on to say in romans chapter 8 the holy spirit will enable us so it's not a, it's not just the holy spirit but also the new resurrection power that is in us gives us the power to gain more and more victory over the rena remaining sins in our lives and that is why paul says very boldly in romans chapter 6 verse 14 of course, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that sin will no longer have dominion over you. Amen. So you can see what the resurrection of Jesus has done for us. Okay, it gives us not only this a new kind of life, a regeneration of life, a new kind of life, a new hope, but also it has we have received this uh, power that we can do great and mighty things and this power that helps us to gain more and more victory over the remaining sins in our 
lives. Okay, we stop here and we'll continue on this point when we come back on Friday. Anyone has any questions? Any questions? No? Okay, uh, today is your, um, I'll be posting the assessment, the second assessment on Christology um, by evening, so you can do that and um, please be honest and sincere in how you write your test. Okay, thank you everyone and see you all on Friday. Thank you. Thank you, sister. Thank you.